Welcome to UCF Nightline, your source for UCF sports and former player information. Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fegley coming to you from the 1148 studios. And right here next to me is... Trace Trolko. Hello, everyone. All righty. We got a lot to talk about this week. We have some very special guests, of course. Terrence Plummer is going to join us. And Stephanie Best. She's the best. She's absolutely the best. The best softball player that UCF has ever had. And arguably the best athlete that UCF has ever had. She is also a UCF Athletic Hall of Fame inductee coming up. Very cool conversation with her. She does a lot to uh, further the career of a lot of softball players and stuff like that. And her interview is cool. So we went to spring practice this week on Tuesday. We managed to align our schedules so that we could be out there at the same time. Did you pick anything up from any of that? What did you see? Uh, They've got a lot of work to do. (laughs) Maybe an understatement. Saw quite a few drop passes, which of course is concern as we're replacing all of the wide receivers that we've gotten accustomed to the last few seasons. Uh, That was what stood out most to me. Yeah, one of the big things for me is how the backup quarterbacks are playing. Not very good to be honest with you. Nick Patty's balls a lot just got blocked by linemen, and Tyler Harris in general looks flat to me. Um, I don't know if he's hurt. I don't know what's going on there, but to me, he looks very flat and like he's not having a good time. I would say if you knew nothing about UCF football, showed up for practice and watched the quarterbacks, you would come away feeling Justin Holman was in fact the starter. Are you saying that I know nothing about UCF football? No, not you. Oh, I'm oh, saying okay. for someone that I'm would just, not I'm, know anything, I'm when you watch you. the three of them throw, I'm messing with you. you feel I'm sure most a lot comfortable of people with don't, Justin I'm Holman. sure a lot of people don't think that I know anything about UCF football, but that's fine. Or, th- or football in general. Yeah. No, no. I think I do. So well, you know a thing or two. It's all that matters. But don't you agree that if you knew nothing and you watched, Holman is clearly uh, a step or more ahead of the others. Absolutely, yeah. 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 It's a position that we feel comfortable with at this point during spring camp that is settled. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I'm, I'm looking forward to Bo Schneider coming in in the fall and seeing what he can do. You know, he, he may be able to, to make a strong case that in his freshman year he should be the number two. That's an interesting statement. We uh, spoke with him a few weeks back. He's, of course, wrapping up uh, high school, which yeah. you forget at times, uh, yeah. and then will be enrolling during the summer. Um, we'll have to see how much of a push whether they want to burn a red shirt uh, to give them a backup yeah, slot. Yeah, I mean, but... I, I don't know if that's, you know, a good idea or not. I, it's probably not a good idea, but I, I think that he could easily come in and compete with the two guys that he's going to have to compete with. Wide receivers, some drop passes on that side of the ball. What about running backs? What did you see? I think Taj, of course, like we were talking about, looks really well. And I'm going to go back on my statements a little bit about standback that I made, and he looks hurt. This week, he does not look hurt. This week, I did not see any limp at all from him, so... I could totally be wrong there. I, I, I'm not a doctor. Nor don't, do you play one on the podcast. No, I don't do x-rays, you know, but I saw him limp and now he's not limping. So that's a that's great news. But I think that having maybe a power back and a speed back option would be awesome. And that would be, in my eyes, that would be William Stanback and Taj McGowan. And coaching staff, Coach O'Leary, high on Taj McGowan so far. I like Tosh. I think Tosh hits the hole pretty well. I've been pleased with him. A couple of plays out, the quarterback handed off too wide and took the back outside. But, you know, I think Tosh hits the hole. He cuts it north and south. He's still a freshman. He has to get stronger and stuff and protection and all that. But you can see he's going to be a good player eventually. Yeah, you know, I think that overall what we've seen in the spring – I'm not nearly as worried as I was before, even about those players, you know, that we've lost and all those receivers and stuff that we've lost. And I don't think O'Leary, he he doesn't seem worried at all. I don't think he worries about much. He has seen an awful lot of football in his day. I hope that he's not too worried, but focused, of course, on making the team better through spring. Yeah, another person that does not sound too worried is Justin Holman, and we have him right here. I think I think we're on a good track right now. I think guys just need to keep uh, giving a good effort and uh, just keep working hard in the film room, the extra workout on the field, and everything. Be honest. You, you can't slack just because you have premier guys leave. Uh, I feel like the guys we got coming back are just as good as those guys. Oh, we'll be just as good. I, we talk all the time. We watch film together. That's the biggest thing. Watch a film together, getting in there and talking over the tape. That's the biggest thing. You really don't know until camp ball. But right now, it, it seems like we're on the same track as we were last year. Until we figure out what type of offense we are, until we figure out our identity. 
Still time to figure it out. More than halfway through spring practice. Of course, the spring game coming up on Saturday, April 18th, 2 p.m. at Bright House Network Stadium. Yeah, we'll be there, and we will hope to see a lot of you there. And we will try to maybe make ourselves visible so people can come up and say hi to us or whatever. I don't know. Are you are we going to tailgate for that? Is anybody tailgating for the spring people game? People tailgate for that. There yeah. are a lot of people out there. Yeah, because the, the gates, I, I saw the gates open at 8 a.m., so... And the game's not till two, so that's a lot of time to do a little tailgating. That'll so. be more time than will be available for a lot of the regular season games. Yeah. So take advantage of that. Absolutely. And you know what? We said this when we were out on Tuesday. For local folks, if you haven't had an opportunity, nearly every one of the practices are open to the public. It really is a neat thing to, in this, in this case, they were in the indoor practice facility, but most times they're on the outdoor practice fields. It really is a good time to just stand out there. You're real close to the action. And, of course, afterwards we saw Justin Holman and other players giving kids autographs. Not a lot of people go out there. A lot is made in Florida of spring training and baseball. This is spring training for UCF football. And that's a lot of access that they give that they don't have to give. I mean, there's programs that don't do that. And it's pretty cool because you're right there. I mean, standing right on the edge of the field the entire time watching these guys practice. My favorite part is when you hear the coaches giving instruction when they get in somebody's face and tell them the right way that they need to be doing something. That's what I like. I yeah, like and learning that's some from the insight that, that people don't have as well. I mean, you can actually come out there and hear what they, they say to the players. So that's cool. It is. And I encourage everybody to get out there. All right. Well, we have a couple other things to talk about, of course. We're going to talk here a little bit about the Bitcoin Bowl. The Bitcoin Bowl, I guess, is no, no more. longer. Yeah, no more. It's gone. So Not the bowl itself, just the sponsorship. Yeah, Bitcoin, I guess, has decided to stop their sponsorship of the bowl game in St. Pete. Of what course, what's funny is that that bowl's been there for a couple of years. As you recall, you were not a big fan of the bowl game experience at Tropicana Field, home of the Tampa Bay Rays. But it's been called the Beef O'Brady's Bowl, <laughs> the St. Petersburg Bowl. We've been in that bowl a couple of times, and it's been called a couple of different things. The toilet bowl? No. no I don't know. No. It, 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 yeah, it was not a good experience. What do you think I, it would cost not, uh, uh, to have it be the uh, Nightline podcast bowl? Yeah, I don't think. Uh, a lot more Bitcoin than I have, I can tell you that. <laughs> I don't have any. How about this one? I actually uh, do have a couple. But a couple of Bitcoins? I do. Somebody sent me, uh, like, you know, a fraction of a Bitcoin or something. Uh, you could send them back and forth. It's and just like, electronic, right? It's not Bitcoin, real. Bitcoin, yes. It's, I mean, it's real, but it's electronic real. And what do you do with it now? Uh, I guess you could have used it there to buy, like, um, a beer or something. My thing was, I was telling people if they could, if they came by my little tent where I had the Nightline podcast banner up, that I would, I would give them a beer. I, I was offering a beer to which you, you know, were going to pay with, for with a Bitcoin. No, no, I had <laughs> beer, and with if someone you know could come up and show me a, an ID, that of course I would not give a miner a beer or anything like that. But if somebody came up, it's a good disclaimer. This absolutely, week. and I did not. And a couple of people came and, and we had a couple, we had a beer together. But anyway, so I said that on Twitter and some, and one of the people from Bitcoin said, here, I'll buy you a beer. Have, have one on me. Here's blank number of Bitcoin. You can use it to buy a beer at the stadium. I didn't buy a beer there because I had had enough beer outside. <laughs> so, so but, you still have a Bitcoin in your account? Yeah. Which you could use. I still don't understand yeah. where you use it, to yeah. be honest with you. You could use it for a lot of things, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's I'd rather use PayPal, personally. <laughs> you know, we we talked about this when UCF was in that Bitcoin bowl, how, boy, it'd be nice to go some other places. Well, there's going to be a bowl for every team if it continues like this. The bowl it's schedule... there a bowl in every town. Well, they're adding games in Tucson, Arizona, and Little Rock, Arkansas. That one, the game in Little Rock, will be affiliated with the American Athletic Conference. That could be called the Crime Bowl. The what bowl? Little Crime. Crime? Crime. The Crime Bowl. Little Rock is known for its, you know crime i'm not sure the chamber of commerce appreciates that they're referring well, fine, to it right now they're as not the, a sponsor so they're referring to it as the little rock bowl so and 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 it would be an aac team against a sunbelt conference team to be played on either cbs sports network or nbc sports network aac commissioner mike oresco had told the orlando sentinel a few months ago that the league was looking into the possibility of creating additional new bowl games in the near future and you know, now I, we have Little Rock, Arkansas on the list. You know, I think the Crime Bowl would be a good spot for Memphis and BYU to go. Oh boy! Because oh, that, remember that brawl? They could have that. Yeah. They could have their fight there, and it would just be normal. Yeah, for, that was quite the brawl at yeah. the end of that game. Yeah. So whatever. 
Yeah, that's cool. I mean, you know, it's good that there's more bowl games coming up. I don't want to get it too saturated. I, I too mean, saturated? It's, it's it seems got, like it's there right now. Yeah. I think any more would be even more saturated. So, yeah, I don't know if it's, it's good, I guess, that there is going to be bowl games. But if there's not the right payout for going to those bowl games, I don't know if it's going to be worth having all of them. I'm talking about payout from whoever is doing the bowl game to pay the teams to go there and play. Well, what's interesting on that, you remember this uh, Duck Commander Bowl in Shreveport, Louisiana, Those that TV show, the reality show, the Duck Commander people, whatever they are. I don't know what Duck they Dynasty. are. Duck Dynasty yeah. people. Yeah. I read I've this week. I never watch it. I read this week that uh, they were the sponsor for that bowl. Do you know what they paid to sponsor that bowl? No. Zero dollars. They used their name. They parlayed the name in that Duck Dynasty, but they paid no sponsorship. This is why I'm telling you, the Nightline Podcast St. Petersburg Bowl. Okay, well, sounds good I'll, because if they don't want money, let's just sign up for that. I would rather have my bowl game at Bright House <laughs> Network Stadium, well, yeah. personally, and that could be changing as well. That could be different here very soon. Well, Orlando's getting a third bowl, but it's going to be played at the Citrus Bowl. But not I'm at talking House. about the name. Oh, yeah. of Bright House Network Stadium could be changing soon because I believe is Charter it, Charter is Charter Communications is buying has put in a bid to buy Bright House Networks for some billions of dollars. In that bitcoins. Would, in bitcoins. In bitcoins, <laughs> yes. And that would make them the largest, uh, the second largest, I believe, cable network company past Time Warner. And they would be buying, I believe, Bright House from Time Warner. So you're saying it might not be Bright House Networks. Stadium. We may be refer- referring to the Charter Bowl or, or Charter Stadium. Charter that, Stadium? Yeah, you know, Something. before we go to our interview with Terrence Plummer, one thing that you and I disagreed about and talked about uh, off uh, the podcast was ESPN put out its uh, preseason football power index. And UCF, not number one, predicted two, three, fifth, fifth. So and- they seem to be saying that we're going to be missing Terrence Plummer and J.J. Wharton and Brashad Perryman and the like. Uh, you don't like the list at all. Right. So the ESPN football power index is this thing and i don't really understand where they get this from i I don't understand where the i don't i don't understand it's computer rankings overall strength heading into the next season yeah i don't know that that's true it's hard for me to see temple being the highest ranked team in the aac when memphis cincinnati and ucf all shared the championship number one which thank god that won't happen again this year It will be a true champion, one champion. Sounds like the Big 12. (laughs) A lot of their starters are returning. Well, we have some question marks. In fairness, we have some question marks. Yeah, they weren't that great of a team. I don't know what their final record was. They didn't make a bowl. They didn't make a bowl. Which is why they're creating more. I mean, come on. You've got to be Or did they make a bowl? No, Temple didn't make a bowl, did they? If it was, it was I don't know, and I honestly don't care, to be honest. The rankings have Temple, Cincinnati, Memphis, Houston, UCF, uh, ECU. East Carolina there. Navy, new to the league. Tulsa, Tulane. Now, this is good. I agree with this. South Florida, 10th. <laughs> so they're at the bottom. That's good. SMU, 11th. And UConn. Oh, God. How did we lose to UConn? Can we, ridiculous. We're going to bring that up Absolutely every year. Ridiculous. Uh, but uh, that now will be in, remembered for years and years and years and years. In fairness to ESPN's rankings, last year they had the top three teams in their preseason poll, Florida State, Oregon, Alabama. Okay, but what, the what was their AAC poll? Do we know that data? I don't know data? that. I don't okay. know that. But well, all think... that matters now is that they've got UCF fifth and uh, agree to disagree or what have you with that Yeah, prediction. I think they're completely wrong, but we'll see. If they're right, it will be in large part because we don't have the likes of Terrence Plummer, who we had an opportunity to sit down with this week. All right, joining us on the phone now, a very, very special guest. We've been waiting to have this guy on for a long time. Number 41, inside linebacker. Terrence Plummer. Terrence, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. I'm just uh, glad that you guys gave me this opportunity to talk to y'all and uh, excited. <laughs> All right, great. Well, we're very excited to have you. Like I said before, before we went on the air here, you are absolutely one of my favorite players. I say that to a few people that I have on here, but, but I... I I mean it every time that I say it because people are probably like he tells everybody they're his favorite player, but but I definitely mean that. One of the things that I've always loved about you is you play with everything, every single down, and that is very rare and very important, I believe. 
We appreciate yes, that. We appreciate what you've done for UCF, and we're very excited to see what you can do in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. First of all, what has your experience being a knight at UCF been like? Yeah, um, I think being a knight has been everything that you could pretty much, you know, call growing up from 18 to 21. It's supposed to be, you know, it's a lot of good time, you know, definitely the wins, all the championships that I've won and everything that, you know, golf has been tough because, you know, you got to balance school, football, and, you know, being a being a, a football player that Coach O'Leary wants, you know what I mean, which is always a challenge. And, you know, there's, you know, life, being things thrown at you, family members passing away, you know, everything. But my experience has been a really great one, and uh, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah, you said about family members passing away, and I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that game. I can't really honestly remember which game that it was, but it was this year. And you, it was BYU. It was BYU. Okay, you had a, a heavy heart, obviously, and you came out there and and you played, I think, stronger and faster and tougher that game than any other game. Even though you played like that a lot, you had definitely <laughs> some extra fire for that game. Tell us what was going through your mind. I know you've been interviewed about it before, but I, I just want to hear it one more time. Yeah, um, just that game. Uh, I had got a call and I heard my um, uncle had died that day. And uh, we were, I was really close to my uncle. He was—he going to help me get, you know, scholarship offers in the in the North Carolina region because he was known through that way. I got something from North Carolina, NC State, because of, because of him. He just always put my name out there, gave my own highlight tape to coaches and everything. And uh, you know, it hurt that he died, but I didn't want to tell my teammates because I didn't want them to worry about me. But I said I was going to play my best that night, you know, to honor him and my teammate and close friend who I grew up with who died, you know, a year, not to that date, but to that month. So it was really close. So I just wanted to go out there and play hard for them. And uh, luckily it ended up being one of the best nights of my life. I don't know what happened. Uh, I, I was focused all during that week, though. And uh, it was a credit to my uh, teammates who went out there and played hard like I did. And we got that win in overtime. So it was a great moment. And I was glad I was able to honor my uncle and my friend with that game. You said that you didn't want to lay that burden on your teammates and you didn't want them to know about it. Why didn't you want them to know about it? I mean, I just didn't want to throw it. I just didn't want to throw off anybody's game preparation to them think worrying about me because of you know me being a starter. You know, sometimes the coaches think your mind's not in the right spot when somebody passes away that's close to you, and they might think you know, well, he's not in the right spot. Should we let him play tonight? And then the teammates, you know, with them being your brothers, they just want to console you. But that 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 means they're taking that little bit of extra energy to worry about you when they could be putting that into themselves to be ready for that game. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. Anybody. Because if I do that, you know, I'm taking away from what my teammates deserve, and they deserve, you know, a, a win tonight because that's what they've been working hard for all week. Especially with us, we were one and two at that point in time, and uh, we were trying to find, we we're trying to come come with up and up against a really good opponent. And uh, you know, I wasn't trying to make a scene, or even not make a scene, but make it make it about a pity party for Pony. But I wanted it to be a, a, a game win for the UCF Knights. You mentioned some ties to North Carolina. You ultimately chose UCF over the likes of Arkansas, North Carolina State, Vandy, and others. What was it that first uh, attracted your attention to UCF, and what was the deciding point for you in choosing the Knights? I think the deciding point was, you know, I came on a visit, and uh, Coach O'Leary was, was uh, the only head coach who came to my house. Um, I mean, I had a lot of other coaches come to my house, like position, position guys, the coordinators, but he's the only head coach who came to my house, and then Coach Bagnett. And they told me, you know, no matter what, you're going you gonna to have four years at UCF and you're going to graduate, which I'm on track to do now. And he said, you know, you're gonna earn, you gonna earn what you get. So if you if you go out there and work hard, and you end up being one of the best players we got, you are gonna start and you are gonna play. But if you don't, you know, if you don't if you don't go out there and produce like you're supposed to, you still gonna graduate, but you're not gonna play. And that's all you can ask for. You can't ask for a handout. You don't want any handouts when it comes to football. And Coach Hood didn't give me that, so I think that's the, I, I think that was the biggest selling point in terms of me going to. UCF. Speaking of Coach O'Leary being a little rough sometimes on you, I watched from the stands for the last couple of years, and I would watch when you came to the sideline and, you know, the, the body language and stuff that was going on between you and Coach O'Leary, and I know that he was hard on you. I know that he was. You could see it. What was that like to have a coach that, that believed in you but that was really hard on you. How does that set you up for the future, and, you know, how did that make you a better player? Oh, man, now I look back on it, man, that's exactly what I needed. I think Coach Leary knew 
how to how to be a motivating factor in my life because I always be one person want to prove somebody wrong. So if, if somebody's yelling at you, telling you you know what you need to do, and you know always on you, it's obvious the reason why they stay on you is because they want you to see. Because if you're if you if you because I look at football like this, you know everybody sees a team game, which it is, but it, it, it takes it takes eleven individuals to succeed at the same time to make the whole team effort great for that offense, defense, or special teams play, whichever's happening. So, you know, I, I, looked at, I looked at it as Coach wanted me to succeed just like he wanted everybody else to succeed. And with him being on me like that and you me as a leader, he felt like he, I was the guy he could get that push to and it would lead to, you know, better results on the field. And I, I thank him for that because that's exactly what I needed. I know whatever type of coaching I get from now on, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, I've been through pretty much the full force of what a coach can do and how a coach can motivate you in a, in a uh, you know, not in a negative way, but in a way of, you know, getting you going. What was like one of the funniest things or one of the things that you really remember him saying to you on the side? Line, just something that maybe the average person, you know, wouldn't know. Oh, probably the Fiesta Bowl we were in practice. Um, I was trying to tell the defense, you know, uh, when we were getting ready for Baylor and how fast they were, and I was telling the defense, you know, to get lined up. You know, I'm trying to make all the calls, but Coach Leary literally almost kicked me out in front of all the ESPN commentators. It's like, man, I'll put you on the first bus back to Florida if you just don't get lined up. And the funny thing is, is on that same play, I just made an interception. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't even... So he wasn't even, you know, happy about the interception. He was mad about the fact that I wasn't getting lined up like I was supposed to, and I was trying to do too much. It's the little he, things. He just wanted. It's the little things, man. Definitely. You talk about this being a team game, certainly, but along the way in your UCF career, you racked up quite a few accolades, uh, some items in the trophy case. Any particular individual award stands out that you're most proud of, uh, especially proud of during your UCF time. Well, actually, my my award that means most to me was this year when I got when I got team MVP. They honestly came from left field because honestly, I didn't think I deserved to be the team MVP, especially with the season Brashad had, Jacoby, you know, all those guys. I thought those guys had a really really great year, but you know, it, it was really an honor to be you know for them to do that because that means the coaches voted for that, and uh, I think that's probably like my biggest thing, you know, especially be amongst my teammates who I feel like are great athletes and are going to go on to the NFL and do great things for them to. You know, for my coaches to vote me that, it really meant a lot to me. You know, I think a lot of fans, myself included, be surprised you wouldn't mention Tostitos Fiesta Bowl defensive MVP. That must also be something you're proud of. Yeah, it is. But I feel like a lot of us could have got MVP that game from defense because of just how good we're playing. You know, Brown had 10 tackles in the interception. Clayton had about 13 tackles. You know, the pass breakup. Sean Mack had like 12 tackles, you know, flying around. I just ended up being the one with the most tackles in the sack. So, you know, it could have went any type of way, but I, it was a blessing winning that, that Joe Cedars Bowl MVP, uh, being up there with Blake and, uh, and all them boys. So it was, uh, it was definitely a blessing, but you know, I'm just, I'm all about the team so it just was just a great honor tell us a little bit about your relationship with uh with margaret williamson there was an article not too long ago and i was just reading it actually uh, about how you met her and do you still keep in contact with her yes i was just talking to her yesterday so can you tell us a little bit about that if they haven't had a chance to see that yeah margaret's like one of my best friends during this process i haven't talked to her too much but i did talk to her yesterday and the day before because she's getting ready for graduation and uh she invited me you know to come and stuff and i can't wait because i haven't seen her in so long but i met her at, at the memorial hospital last year when i went and visited and uh i just remember uh seeing her come in the room and she was smiling at how happy she was at us and uh everything that was going on and uh she was just happy that we came and visited her and uh you know i don't know she just remembered me we made a special bond she came to uh her first college football game and i played really well that game and i was able to get her a jersey and i uh, met her family and her sister and stuff but she just had so much life and despite you know whatever's going on and she's just living the you know took home with teenage like i don't try to bother her too much i understand she just got a driver's permit just went to prom and stuff so i just try to keep in touch with her and let her know i love her and care about her and that you know that i'm always here if she ever needs me for anything and that she inspires me to go play hard too a couple of things here that we've we've talked about already make you kind of a, a special guy and a and a guy that 
you know, I've, I've always thought that you played with your heart and, and it's obvious that you have a big heart and, and that's cool. That's incredibly cool. So tell us a little bit about what's been going on the last couple months with the NFL Players Association game, the Senior Bowl, the Pro Day that just got over this week. Tell us about your prep. Tell us about, uh, just tell us anything you can about the last couple months. I guess, well, yeah, well, after the bowl game, took a little time off, you know, just to reflect on senior year and stuff and just relax, you know, body ready. And then literally two weeks later, I had to get ready for the NFL PA Bowl, which is in uh, California in Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, I wanted to go out there and show that, you know, I was one of the top linebackers in the country. And I think I proved it. You know, I had a really good week of practice. Um, you know, you tried to show, you know, what type of athlete I was. You know, a lot of people had doubts about, you know, my type, my skill and, you know, things of that nature. So I just tried to go out there and do my best and, uh, you know, just try to make a name for myself and let the scouts know, you know, I, I deserve to be up in the top rankings of whatever inside linebacker you have in this draft. And then um, I played really good, um, I believe, you know, from what I was told, and then uh, I got a text message from Phil Savage asking if I wanted to be in the Senior Bowl, and uh, I said yes, sir. And luckily, that I was able to come through, so I was able to get out there to Alabama to right next week and uh, hop in the Senior Bowl. And I got to practice one day, and I got to play in the game, which is a blessing. Really, I really had 24 hours to get ready for the game, you know, and try to go out there and do my best. And uh, I think I, I think I came away. I think I uh, impressed a few people just how I was able to come out there with a the little bit of time that I had and uh, show that you know I could could be willing to hop on a plane and I'd come to your team and be able to contribute. And then um, after the Senior Bowl. Took another week off, and then I went right to training. I trained at Tom Shaw in Orlando with uh, some great athletes, you know, some guys who were um, probably going in the first round this year. And, uh, you know, just went out there and competed with them every day to try to get better. And I did that from I did that all the way from uh, the end of January all the way to the uh, middle of March, and then we had pro day. And uh, you know I had a I had a great transformation. I lost 14 pounds, and I gained muscle mass. So I think everybody appreciated that. You know I did really well in my pro day. Wish I could have ran a little bit faster, but I like my times. You know I, I think I went out there competed like I was supposed to, and the scouts were really pleased. And now I'm just in this in this next month, just waiting and seeing what's the next opportunity for me in terms of workouts and visits, and uh, you know. Just just staying positive. How close did you come to that Prashad Perryman 40 time? <laughs> I was nowhere near. Man. I, was, I don't think anybody there was within point two of that. So, And the thing is, you know, Perryman it starts with a T, so I had to run right behind him. How do you follow that one up? You know, the Knights are in the midst of their uh, spring camp, uh, this uh, 2015 crop. Are you a little nostalgic? Do you miss being out there uh, at this time of year with the guys? Yeah, you do. You always miss, you know, you know, that spring football, you know, that opportunity to go back and prove yourself and, that's one thing I'm missing out on. I don't got spring football anymore. You know, NFL literally you play from all the way from July all the way up to January and February. You know, if you make it to the Super Bowl, so it's a long season. So I do miss the spring football in that aspect. But now I just have to go on to bigger and better things. I want those guys to make their legacy known. I gotta ask you about since you were there when Perryman did that. What did you think? Was that were you surprised by that? Because I know a lot of us were. No, I knew Shaw was going to run fast. I mean, I, I don't know if a lot of us thought four too fast, you know, because that's just another world class type speed. But I, you know, I've always known Brashad, and I knew Speedy and those guys. Those guys are elite, elite speed athletes, you know. And that's a credit to him, you know, and not to nobody else because he went out and worked when he went to Michael Johnson performance and when he went to uh, Pete Bomarito and went out there and ran and uh, did all the work he needed to do. And uh, you know. Like they say, you know, uh, you reap what you sow. So I'm sure he sold a lot of hard work and he reaped a good award of that for it too. So I'm proud of him. As Knights fans reflect back on your career in the years ahead, what would you say your legacy is at UCF? I don't know, man. I just want to be remembered as a productive linebacker who always brought it, you know, brought it all, you know, my, I had a personal goal within myself to be the greatest linebacker in UCF history. I don't know if I did that, but I want to be like when I went up. You came pretty close if you didn't, man. <laughs> I guarantee yes, sir. it. I, yes, sir. I just wanted to go out there and be that type of, you know, player that people remember, you know. And that's the same goal I have going into NFL. I tell myself, you know, you have to put in the work if you want to be one of the greats. And uh, that's what I just want to be known for. I was a guy who wasn't the tallest, wasn't the biggest, definitely wasn't the fastest. But when it came to preparation for the game – and when it came to tenacity and intensity and knowing how to play football, I was the person that you could rely on the most. 
How does all that set you up for the rest of your your life, really, going through playing for George O'Leary and all that, and the coaches that we have? Does, did you learn a lot about life, not just about football? Yes, definitely. In this program, I think you learn more about life than you, than you ever would football. Because, you know, when you get in college and you're in the pro-style defense and the pro-style offense, you learn X and O's. I mean, in the pro, they might switch up some variations, some main calls and everything. But football is football at the end of the day. But the life lessons that you learn from football, it teaches you how to overcome adversity. It teaches you how to be a professional, how to be on time, how to be, you know, well-managed in the, in the eye of the world because you're always under a microscope. Those are the type of lessons that football, Georgia O'Leary, and UCF teach you. And those will go those will go far beyond when I'm done playing football. Because football, you know, NFL stands for not for long. So I don't know how long I might be in the NFL. Hopefully it's going to be for a long time. But regardless, even if you play 10 years and you're done with football, I'm 31 years old with a whole life to live. So UCF definitely taught me some great life lessons. You know, fans are very passionate about the Knights program. Sometimes we forget that you're a student athlete. Talk about your academic success at UCF and what uh, lies ahead for you in that regard. Yeah, that's that's the truth. Um, people sometimes forget that we have to, like days, we have to go to practice that morning after a whole night of studying because we have a big exam on that Thursday before we have to hop on the bus that Friday. There's all type of stuff that we have to deal with, you know. And, uh, you know, I wish, I wish fans would see, you know, just realize, you know, sometimes they're tough on us and rough on the kids because, you know, sometimes we may not perform up to par, which, you know, that's, a, that's, that's on us too, but just be a little lenient because there are, we also have a, a very high academic standard at UCF, which coach always wants us to uphold. And you can see that in our graduation rate, which is like, it's the highest out of all the, even the Power Five schools except for Stanford, you know, and that's a, that's a, that's a, a testament to what coach has always taught us, you know, you're going to have faith, family, then you're going to have academics, football, and then your social life is last. So, you know, that's the type of things we do. And, uh, you know, it's definitely rough. I'm still in school now while I've been training, and uh, I'm planning on graduating real soon. So it's definitely been tough, but it's, it's been rewarding. What's up next in the next month? I mean, it has to be hard to kind of sit around and, and wait to see what's going to happen. Not that you're sitting around. I don't mean that because you're working out and, and doing all that stuff. What comes next? Next thing is, you know, like you said, workouts. I'm still working out, you know, just making sure I'm ready. Um, just waiting for some private workouts, you know, the workout with teams. Hopefully those will be coming up soon. Uh, some visits to some teams, you know. Most times the visits go to the first round guys, the guys they want to pick early. If later on they try to get guys in that they feel could fit into their to their programs, whatever NFL team that they are, organizations. So and then it's just a waiting game, you know. Um, regardless if I get drafted or not, I know I'll be on a team. I know I'll be picked up, and I know from then on, it's, it's everybody's the same after the draft. You know, we're all rookies, all trying to make a team, and I'm I'm just trying to be one of the guys that makes it to that one percent into the NFL, regardless of doing anything that they require me to do. That's what my mind's at. You know, uh, I was having a hard time. I was having a hard time being patient with it. You know, just like oh, what's going to happen, but I got to be patient and just and just excited for my opportunity that's going to come. I think that you're going to do an awesome job, and I, I know you'll be somewhere playing football so i think that's all that matters we'll be proud of you wherever you go and and however much you get to play and and we'll follow you and all that if you could say one thing to the ucf fans that have watched you for the last four years what would it be i would just say thank you thank you for all the love thank you for traveling out there in arizona when nobody gave us a chance and you know, thank you for just you know being true night fans for those who are true night fans who always represented the team in a in a good classy way and always was supportive of the Knights. I just want to say thank you. All right, that's perfect. We are gonna miss you, Terrence. It's gonna be weird going and and not seeing you out there on the field, but we will follow you. I promise you. And uh, I hope that you'll keep in contact with us. And you know, we'll hope to talk to you at another time. Yes, sir. For Th- sure. Thank I'll you so much. For, all right, great. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, you know what they say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We don't need to know about your fun-filled weekend in the city of sin, but we hope you'll click the ad on our website. It's right there to the left, the one that screams you have to save up to 50% off your next trip to Vegas. Just click on the ad and we promise never to talk about what happened in Vegas. This is Kyle Israel, and you're listening to the Nightline Podcast. All righty. Thank you, guys. Liked that interview with Terrence Plummer. That was awesome. I, I love that guy. He is, like, one of the coolest guys ever. Yeah, like very, a very cool conversation with him. 
All right, so uh, another cool guy that I've tried to get a hold of. I've tried and tried and tried to get a hold of Perryman. I guess we're not big time enough to talk to. He may not something. have time with all of the interviews and places that he's uh, he's going. Yeah, so I guess we both have little lists here. Dolphins, Giants, Eagles, Lions, Ravens, and there's there's more. Colts, Panthers, Cardinals, Titans. Yeah, these are all Nearly like Nearly every NFL team official, appears interested yeah, in him. They're all official visits for him, so that's great. I mean, he is definitely... You know, I've heard anywhere from 10 to 14 as far as the pick for him. I've heard even higher a couple times. Um, higher than what? Than 10. Than 10? Yeah, I've heard top 10. I've heard uh, down to 14. I've heard, you know, all kinds of things. So I believe, yes, one person said that it would be higher than 10. But I, I don't believe that. First wide receiver picked, all that stuff. We'll see. But... He's going to be, it's going to be great. It would be awesome if we did have at least, you know, it would be two years in a row with a first round top 25. Is there any doubt in your mind right now, a couple of weeks out from the NFL draft, that he's a first round pick? Would it surprise you? No, I don't think so. Not a first. Yeah, I think he'll go in the first round. So how about the week before we crystal ball gaze and make our selection on which pick that he'll go? Or are you just going to assign him to Kansas City and... Well, I'd love him to go to Kansas City. I don't think he's going to be available. They're way down, right? They're, they're, they're down. not way down, but they're. I think they're 18 or something. I don't think he might be still there. be there. I think that there's other. It's suggested that he's. You know, I heard today St. Louis. I, I'd have to look at, at all that stuff. Again. He's going to be rumored right everywhere. Remember, we read the list last week. Almost every NFL team on their website did a story on his yeah. time because that made, of course, national news. Right. His stock has just skyrocketed since he did that so and that's understandable like i said before i thought that it hurt him that he did not go to the combine and and perform because he was hurt i think that that at first hurt him but then he really had to pull something out to you know get his stock back up and he did and you heard terrence Plummer, you know talk a little bit about that as well that it was pretty amazing terrence Plummer just a tad bit slower yeah well it's okay (laughs) it's understandable it's definitely understandable a little bit more weight there and, and a little bit slightly to, more yeah different positions you so. know the focus of course uh, we've been focusing a lot on the guys that will uh, likely be nfl picks but there are other sports and there are other professional leagues and other ucf names are uh, are making news for being drafted in the pros yeah go ahead and tell us about that trace 16th overall pick i'd never heard of this team though the dallas charge selected UCF softball senior Kaylee Novak. It's the 2015 National Pro Fast Pitch Draft. Novak was the first selection in the fourth round, becoming the highest draftee in UCF program history. And Novak joins former UCF standout Stephanie Best as NPF draft picks. And we learned in this interview that we did with Stephanie earlier in the week that she actually recruited Novak when she was at UCF, which is really cool. I think that's awesome. And, of course, Best is uh, going to be a UCF Athletics Hall of Fame inductee coming up on Friday night, April 17th. All right, we are here on the phone with Stephanie Best. Stephanie is being inducted into the UCF Athletics Hall of Fame. She was a softball player. Stephanie, how are you doing today, and what does it feel like to be inducted into the UCF (laughs) Athletics Hall of Fame? (laughs) Well, I'm feeling great, and uh, obviously it's uh, it's a huge honor. Uh, It makes my heart extremely happy that UCF allowed me to uh, leave a footprint on the on the university so i'm really excited and humbled by it all how did you learn that you were being inducted uh, i actually got a call from todd sansbury the ucf athletic director he was just letting me know he was, had some exciting news for me and he didn't uh he didn't waste any time he went ahead and uh let me know and uh, congratulated me on the honor did you ever think that anything like that would come your way when you were part of the uh, start of ucf softball gosh you know, i don't i don't know that you ever really know that kind of stuff i think uh our team did a really, really good job back in the day. So um, I know we're creeping up on the 10-year mark where our team as a whole, I think, would be recognized for being the first group to win the conference tournament and things like that. But uh, this is obviously icing on the cake, and uh, I'm really excited because I've invited a lot of my teammates to come to the banquet who will actually be there to accept this honor with me. You ask another person to come with you to that uh, induction ceremony as well. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> uh, 
are, are we talking about Derek Jeter? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, I did a formal uh, a formal invite. I made a YouTube video to invite him to uh, to come be my honorary plus one. Uh, as you know, with, with him retiring this past season, uh, he's just done so many great things for the game, so many great things for the sports world in general. And then just watching how he handled himself and going through the process of uh, that entire season, I just I gained so much more respect than I already had for him. And I just thought it was so touching. I think anybody, whether you're a sports fan or not, to kind of watch him go through that, see what he means to, you know, the sport of baseball and to, to the Yankees. Uh, specifically, it's just a really cool thing. So I followed his career, and as a former shortstop, I you know mimicked my playing a lot after him. So I felt like you know if there's any way to be able to kind of help honor him as well, that's why I chose to do that. And have you heard anything back from him? How's that campaign going? No, I haven't. I haven't. I did the video release, and uh, I don't know him personally, so it was more kind of a fun way for me to be able to honor him. I know it was a long shot, and we haven't heard anything back, and I'm not sure that we will or not. So I hope it, at least I hope that he'll be able to watch the video, you know, just to see. So he knows he's definitely impacted not just baseball players, but softball players, too, that have watched him compete over the years. Yeah, I saw the video. It was awesome. It was a very good creation, and, and I, I thought it was cool that you had all the people that, you know, we're saying the, the the hashtag thing. It was, uh, what was the hashtag again? I'm sorry. The what will it take? What will it take? Yeah, I thought that that yeah. was really cool, though. The, the whole video was awesome. So oh, I, thank you so much. I hope that he, you know, at least replies to that. I, I would be disappointed if he didn't because it was such a good deal. <laughs> hey, well, if you guys know anyone out there that can get that video to him, you guys help out too. <laughs> I will do my best, actually, on that. I will see what I can do as well. Uh, thank you, thank you. Take us back to you choosing UCF, a program that was starting. What was it about the Knights that uh, attracted your attention? Uh, I'll be honest what you just said. Um, I, I was able to be a part of a group of players that were going to be of the inaugural class. As ironic as it is now to say that loud, is, is part of making history from a small town in South Carolina. So when I came to do my recruiting visit, as you can imagine, from being like small town in the woods and everything, and then uh, getting off an airplane and seeing palm trees and how beautiful it was uh it was a pretty easy decision for me at the time because i wanted to be a part of something special and then gosh you, you walk on campus it's one of the most beautiful campuses in the entire country so that was a pretty easy selling point you talk about something special the softball team has something special going on in 2015 what's it like oh to, gosh, uh, to yeah. watch a, a top 20 ranked program out at ucf it's unbelievable. It's awesome. It's, uh, I think all, all of us that have played for the program, I'm seeing so much action on social media, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that of former players being so proud to be at night at this point. You know, you always hope you, you want the program to get better and better and better. Uh, and you want people to break your records. You want to continue to break team records and things like that. And I think this group of girls is absolutely doing that and they're making history. They've got the best ranking, uh, they've ever, ever had within the UC a softball program so it's very cool to see it just sounds like they've got a great team overall they, they've got their stud players their stud pitchers their position players but uh you know to be ranked you've really got to have a solid team and they've they've obviously got that if you notice this week a knight was selected for professional play selected to play and you parlayed your ucf career into the pros what was it like playing professionally it was great I loved it. I, I had the opportunity. I got to play for about five years. And you're honestly, truly playing with the top players in the entire country. So it's such a neat thing to happen for Kaylee Novak. I'm I'm so excited for her. And I, did, I think she's going to love it. It's going to raise her level of play even more, too, you know, competing against the best players in the country. So it, it's a neat, neat experience. And, if, gosh, if you've got the opportunity to at least do it one year even, I think you got to do it. I think you got to take advantage and, and have fun and uh, just know you got to compete at a top level with competitors like that. A lot of us, I being one personally that have never seen a professional softball game, what is, what's it like playing professional softball? What, what are the venues like? What are the games like? What's the whole, just explain the whole thing to us. <laughs> 
the first thing that comes to my mind, a lot of strikeouts. Oh, okay. <laughs> when I played, I played against the, the pitchers we competed against on a regular basis were Ken Osterman, Jenny Finch, Monica Abbott. Uh, so as you can imagine, I had my fair share of some tough at bats. So, I, I mean, just the level of play. There's not, in, in college, you have so many high scoring games. No one is scoring more than a couple runs off any of those pitchers. Um, Jenny's now retired, but Monica and uh, Chad are still competing in that league. So it's a tough game offensively. It's uh, I, That was probably one of my downfalls is, gosh, I had such a, a blessed, great career at UCF, and offense was what I was known for, hitting home runs, things like that. And then I went into pro league, and it was it was a rude, humbling awakening, to say the least. I got out a lot more times than I planned on. But, again, you know, when you're facing the best of the best, you just got to work harder, and you got to compete more and, and be even more disciplined. That was probably my biggest growing years as far as making adjustments. I, I completely changed the lower half of my swing at one point just to be more consistent to try to make sure I can compete at that level. Kaylee's going to have an awesome, awesome time. She's going to do well in that league, too. She's the type of player. She can play middle infield. She's fast. She's quick. I actually, I'm not sure if you know this part, but I actually recruited Kaylee Novak to go to UCF. I was an assistant coach there. I'm on staff for about five years with UCF, and I recruited Kaylee Novak, Mackenzie Otis, that group of kids, were my recruiting class. So for me, I saw, uh, I tracked the draft when it happened the other night, and my heart about burst when I saw Kaylee got drafted. I thought that was such a neat thing, and she got drafted in the fourth round, which was the exact round that I got drafted in. Oh, that's uh, cool. So it was just such a neat thing that I knew she was a star when I recruited her. So getting to see her continue to almost follow my footsteps as a shortstop and, and doing that, I mean, she's doing big things. Uh, so I loved it. It's so cool. And I'm so proud and happy happy for her. We've been talking a lot about UCF softball. We're trying to cover it, you know, more than probably anyone else is, to be honest with you. And we've talked a lot about one of the pitchers this year, and she's thrown a lot of no-hitters. Shelby Turner, yeah. Yeah. Which, yes. Which I'm not horribly familiar i'm sorry with with the game of softball especially in college but is that a normal thing for people to throw no hitters like that is that a thing that happens more in softball than it does say in baseball uh, it is, it's not normal, but I'll tell you, a no hitter is a, is a group effort. So obviously the pitcher, the pitcher and the catcher are the two most important parts about the no hitter, but if you don't have a solid defense, that doesn't happen. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you gotta have a defense that can take base hits away and make those big plays. And I'll tell you that the duo of, uh, Shelby and McKenzie is just unbelievable. It seems like ranked nationally, you know what I mean? Uh, an ERA. So what they're doing, they're making history right now. Now. There's never been a duo at UCF to do with their, you know, we've had the great Allison Kime to me was uh, probably the best pitcher statistically I think that's been through there. I mean, Allison's got, she only played at UCF for two years and four year players are just now approaching trying to beat her record. So it's uh, pretty unbelievable what, what some of these pitchers can do. And uh, every time you see a no hitter, I'll tell you that's amazing stuff and know they're making history when you see that it is not easy to do at all. By the way, Turner had National Pitcher of the Week honors, two wins, two saves, her second no-hitter in a six-day span. That's unbelievable. It is. I saw that, too, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be accurate here, but I want to say she's already been National Pitcher of the Week twice this year. Uh, to be National Player of the Week, period, is is unheard of just about. I mean, there's, you know, you got there's over 300 Division One teams, and then you're one of thousands of players competing, and then you get the honor to have it twice and I think it has happened twice in one year to me is unbelievable to accomplish a feat like that well that's kind of saying something that we have some of the best players in all of college softball at UCF yeah <laughs> to me that's that's saying a lot because that's not yeah. you know it's obviously not something that's that's you know totally normal there's top players in the country that can go their whole career without getting a, a pitcher of the week nomination you know what i mean so it's just kind of doing the right thing at the right time and having a great week against certain competitions so I'll tell you, they've, they've done some big things that's for sure and it's, it's fun to watch it's fun to see what they're doing so you played collegiately uh, professionally you coached what are you doing now uh, 
gosh, great question. Now I'm just continue to try to share my passion of, of loving the game of softball and training kids. So I coached at UCF. I loved my experience there. But I was itching to do a little bit more of the training for the younger kids in the community. So actually, I started a company called Pro Swings. And what we do is we do anything from camps for the younger kids, college exposure camps. We do one-on-one developmental training. Uh, we also are, we just got into... Recently, we're helping kids make the recruiting videos. So basically using our experience, I've got a couple of people that work with me that do the training. We use our experiences past collegiate players and coaches to help set the kids up for success. So I guess one of my favorite parts is all my all my old pro ball teammates, most everybody coaches still, so it's a good excuse. We've, uh, we've had a really good turnout at our camps between Orlando, Florida, and South Carolina, and I literally just invite all my old teammates that are coaching around the country. I bring them in, and I know these kids are going to get the best possible training, the development, and, and coaches that are passionate about the game that know how to get the kids to the next level. So, and I love it. I've uh, started Pro Swings about two years ago, and and I've loved it. We've just gotten a great, great response in the softball community, specifically in the southeast, but uh, even more so catching some national attention of parents find their kids that come to our camp. So it's been pretty cool. Is it based in Orlando? All of our training uh, is based in Orlando. We do all of our private instruction and team clinics out at Seminole State. And then all of our camps, we've been doing in Altamont Springs. There's a five-field venue there. Each camp, we've got around 200 kids, and we've got about 30 college coaches. UCF, Hillary Barrow at UCF works most of our camps. Uh, always get a ton of local representation of schools around here, whether it be Florida, FAU, FIU, UCF, Seminole State, Daytona State, and then we also branch out. So the other coaches that come from around the country, Minnesota's coaches come, uh, Minnesota, Virginia Tech, Ole Miss, Auburn, LSU comes to all of them. So, I mean, a, a great representation. We're aiming towards getting a couple more new ones and having Georgia in. So just schools that the kids get excited about. But, again, these are past professional players that I'm bringing in uh, to work with the kids hands-on. You know, there's a lot of things that you can teach as far as uh, mechanics and how to swing and how to throw and how to play defense and all that stuff but what has college softball or softball in general what impact has it had on the rest of your life I, I'll tell you that that's an awesome question and I, I encourage everyone to get involved in sports for, for what it means. I mean, it helps build character. It helps build discipline. It helps even with the simple things like time management. It's helped with my leadership skills. Like 10 years ago, I had no clue I was going to own a business and, and run something. You know what I mean? And I think the skill set that you get from being on a team, having to work with communication and step up and be clutch when it matters, all those things I think play a huge role. I think that's why athletes are so successful when they go into the real world and, and it's time to get a real job. Uh, athletes know how to be re- accountable and responsible and uh, more than anything, I think, I think strong leaders because you have to be, you know, as an athlete when you're on a team sport. Absolutely. It takes a lot of heart to do all those things, too. And I think that the, the best athletes have a huge heart. Yeah, I, I, I don't you're know right. It's, it's the inner drive and the passion just is great. It's like what I'm doing now. I mean, I'm not doing this, obviously, to get rich or anything. I'm doing it because I genuinely love it. This is my expertise, I guess, so to speak, in the field that I'm in, and I, I love it. I love, I'm love. i so driven to do more and more for the softball community, come up with innovative ideas, and that's my personality, aside from being an athlete. That's my personality type of being a competitor and wanting to, to be the best at something or wanting to be a part of a, of a team that is just doing such great things for people and making a difference. I've gotten all of that from being an athlete, I think. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I want to give you an opportunity to tell people where they can contact you or where they can find you online and various social media things. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got a website called proswings.com, and then we've also got all of our social media uh, uh, handles, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We've got all that. So anyone looking to uh, contact me or us or whatever, it's just to say hello, or you, you've got some kids you want to get involved with proswings, you let us know. It, it, it'll be our pleasure. So it's proswings.com. Yep, P-R-O-S-W-I-N-G-S dot com. Cool, very cool. All right, well, thank you so much. Congratulations, we're proud of you, and uh, I, I wish nothing but the best for you. Oh, thank you guys so much. This was really fun. I appreciate you uh, even wanting to interview me, like I said in the beginning. It's, uh, it's a pretty neat feeling, and two weeks from today is probably going to be one of the most special days of my life, so thank you for uh, helping make it even more special.
What's up, Knight fans? This is Jeff Sharon from Sports Talk Florida, and you're listening to the Nightline Podcast. Yes, you are, and so good to have Stephanie Best going to represent UCF well in that Athletics Hall of Fame. Tickets still available for that Friday night, April 17th, out at the Bright House Network, still Bright House Network Stadiums. For a little uh, while. Recruiting Lounge. Uh, you can go on to UCFathletics.com for more information on that. All right, and then after that, the spring game, so th- the next day. It's a good so, weekend yeah. uh, to celebrate all things UCF Athletics. Very cool. Time for news and notes. Joined by Tina, my fiance, this time. For UCF Baseball, senior Zach Rogers pitched his second career complete game and tallied a personal best 11 strikeouts in number six UCF's 2 to 1 victory over Cincinnati on Saturday afternoon. Still, though, a, a tough stretch for the Knights, who dropped the first two games on the road at the AAC's last place team. UCF is now 23 and 10 overall and 3 and 3 in the AAC. UCF softball took two of three on the road at Tulsa, including a 16 and in win on Friday night, the longest game in program history. The 16th ranked Knights are now 36 to 6 overall and 8 and 1 in the AAC. Two wins, two saves, and her second no-hitter on a six-day span led junior Shelby Turner, named American Athletic Pitcher of the Week for the second consecutive Monday. The UCF pitching staff has the lowest earned average in the nation for the last three weeks, posting a combined ERA of 0.90 this week. Turner ranks second in the nation individually with a 0.79 ERA, while senior Mackenzie Otis, 0.95 ERA, ranks fourth in Division I. UCF sophomore Ryan Stovash was tabbed the American Athletic Conference Men's Golf Player of the Week. Stovash led UCF to FAU Sloanen Autism Invitational title and took medalist honors. UCF 4x800 meter re- relay team highlighted the night's competition in the second, act, second day of action at the Pepsi Ford Relays, setting a new school record and winning the event in a time of 8 minutes, 38 seconds. UCF women's tennis notched its 10th win of the season on Saturday afternoon against UAB 4-0. to UCF hosts Louisiana Lafayette in the final regular season match of the spring, April 11th at noon. UCF men's tennis team defeated number 65 Troy 4-1 to on Friday at the UCF Tennis Complex. The Knights improved to 14-8 and on the season. Speaking of tennis, officials from Lake Nona, the United States Tennis Association, local government and businesses will gather this week for an official groundbreak-in ceremony of the new $60 million Home of American Tennis in southeast Orlando. This state-of-the-art facility will become the home of UCF men's and women's tennis. In basketball, Miami knocked Temple out of the NIT tournament. That'll do it for this week. I'm Andrew Fagley for Trace Trelko and Tina Riddle. This has been episode number 37. Go Knights! Charge on! Victory is our cry, B-S-E-T-O-R-Y, two nine or nights will shine.